All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Sarah Burris. I'm the scientific liaison here at Fujifilm Visual Sonics. And we have a very exciting webinar by Dr. Amen Zlitny, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. And Dr. Zlitny's work focuses on the photoacoustic and fluorescent molecular imaging of bacterial infections, the development, preclinical evaluation, and what are the means for clinical translation. So just some notes about this webinar. A recording of the webinar will be made available at the end of the presentation. All of the lines are currently muted during the duration of the webinar. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And all questions will be answered at the end of the session. The duration of the talk is expected to be anywhere from 45 to 50 minutes. And the following 10 to 15 minutes will be reserved for questions. So just some information about our presenter today. Dr. Schlitney is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Radiology and Molecular Imaging Program at Stanford University under the mentorship of Dr. Sam Gambier. In 2010, he moved to Canada and joined the research group of Dr. John Valiant at McMaster University to pursue his PhD in chemical biology. During his PhD tenure, he worked on several multidisciplinary projects that focused on the development of new multimodal imaging probes for ultrasound, optical, and radio imaging of cancer. At Stanford, his research focuses on developing small molecule, antibody, and nanoparticle-based imaging agents for fluorescence, ultrasound, and photoacoustic imaging of diseases such as cancer and bacterial infections. His ultimate goal is to be an independent scientist and run a research group dedicated to developing theranostic agents which can help detect and treat diseases such as cancer and infection. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Schlitney. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And I'm really excited to share a project uh, that I've been working on here at Stanford, uh, which focuses on developing a new tool to diagnose uh, bacterial infections and more specifically infections of surgical sites and wounds. So as we all know, bacterial infections are of mounting medical and public concern worldwide. And this is mainly due to the emergence of drug-resistant bacteria. If we look here in the bottom left, we find that over time, there's an increase in the amount of bacteria that are resistant to our antibiotics. In the same time, we also find here on the middle that we are not producing enough antibiotics to treat these uh, infections. Hence, uh, with, over time, when there's an increase in human life expectancy, this increases the number of fragile individuals which are susceptible to infection, as well as necessary medical procedures and medical implants, which unfortunately provide means sometimes for bacterial uh, precipitation. And diagnosing such infections uh, later on in the stage makes it much more costly and harder uh, to treat, and it further uh, burdens uh, the patient. For example, uh, fracture fixations in the United States, it's expected there are around 2 million fracture fixation devices uh, which are inserted annually. And the infection incident in such infections is around 1 to 2 percent in closed fractures, but this dramatically increases to around 30 percent in open fractures. And uh, although the average treatment uh, success rate can go up to 90 percent, it is shown to double in treatment costs when these complications happen. This is why it is extremely important to diagnose such infections at an early stage to properly determine the optimal way of uh, treating uh, these infections. Unfortunately, current uh, diagnosis approaches uh, rely either on blood-based, uh, microbiology or histopathology-based, or imaging. And these techniques are either not sensitive or specific or take time, uh, as well as uh, even with the most accurate approaches using histopathology, it takes some time uh, to uh, diagnose these infections. And imaging, while it does provide uh, some uh, important anatomical information, uh, imaging modalities currently on their own can only provide uh, information when bacterial infections are at a higher stage and cause major uh, tissue damage. And in this case, the bacterial burden would increase, making it much more costly to treat. So to summarize the issue, there is increase in human life expectancy and increase in antibiotic resistant bacteria. So there are more chances of uh, bacterial infections in surgical and sites and wound sites. And uh, bacterial infections of wounds and surgical sites are known to increase hospitalization, which increases cost and are major burden on patients' quality of life. 
This is why it is important to develop an uninvasive tool to rapidly di diagnose and determine uh, infection, uh, the infection of surgery and wound sites to properly determine the optimal way of treatment. And in this case, we suggest the utility of a molecular imaging strategy. And molecular imaging is known as a methodology to use, uh, that is used to non-invasively visualize biochemical changes in living subjects. Advantages of molecular imaging, that it improves the chances of early diagnosis of many diseases. It helps the evaluation of new treatments. And it offers a great tool for in vivo studies where we can study uh, diseases and biochemical processes, both in animal models as well in humans. So there are a variety of uh, molecular imaging tools that are being used both in the preclinical settings for animals as well as in humans. And what we care about here in the Visual Sonic Symposium or webinar is the photoacoustics and ultrasound. And in many cases, there are advantages and disadvantages in each imaging modality. Uh, some, uh, as shown here in maroon, uh, provide mainly anatomical information, while others, shown here in blue, provide functional information. And in many cases, sometimes there are uh, interests to combine uh, imaging modalities where we can take advantage of the anatomical information from one and provide functional information from the other. And in order to conduct molecular imaging, we need what we call a molecular imaging probe. And this imaging probe is uh, made of a, number one is a part that is providing the signal that we can detect with the imaging system. So this is either a signaling agent or a contrast agent as well as a targeting vector. And a targeting vector is usually a small molecule or a protein that ensures the delivery of the signaling agent to the disease site in high specificity uh, and quickly. And we usually attach the signaling agent to a targeting vector through a linker in which we can conduct a lot of modifications to improve how well this imaging probe distributes within the body. And here is a very uh, small table that summarizes some contrast agents as well as the perspective imaging modalities used to detect uh, these imaging uh, agents. And in our case, we're interested in optical dyes uh, where we use optical and photoacoustic imaging uh, for this application. And the reason we're interested in these two imaging modalities is that fluorescence and photoacoustic imaging are safe, transportable, and uh, relatively low in cost compared to all the other imaging modalities. In addition, they can provide real-time imaging with high spatial resolution. So this is very important. And one major limitation in such imaging modalities is the limited depth. So because of the limited depth, we're not, we're not able to utilize these imaging modalities for whole body imaging. Hence, we think that these uh, tools can be advantageous in imaging superficial infections or through intraoperative uh, imaging. Uh, and this is why we want to focus on utilizing this platform to diagnose bacterial infections of wounds and surgical sites. So in fluorescence imaging, we basically use a laser to uh, excite a fluorescent imaging probe, which will produce emitted photons that we can detect using a camera. While in photoacoustic imaging, uh, it's basically a modality that is combined with ultrasound. And while in ultrasound, we send ultrasound waves and then measure the reflected ultrasound waves back, in photoacoustic imaging, we use a laser that, if you look here in the right, an example for molecular uh, imaging uh, using photoacoustics, where we have bacterial infection, as an example here, and we have the imaging probe that accumulates in bacteria. And using this near-infrared pulse laser that is attached to the ultrasound probe, we can excite these uh, imaging agents at the site of interest, in which they will absorb the energy and produce really small, tiny expansion uh, due to heat, and this will cause uh, production of acoustic waves, which are then detected using ultrasound. So the main objective of my work is to develop a fluorescent and highly specific infection imaging agent, which can be used as a screening tool to determine the expect extent of infection during injury and surgery, as well as a means to differentiate between infection and other diseases, such as inflammation, and monitor the effect of treatment. So the vision here is since we can uh, transport uh, photoacoustic imaging and photoacoustic imaging also provides a further improvement uh, compared to fluorescence where the imaging depth is from, from one centimeter improved to around six centimeters. We can have such imaging systems as these tools shown here. And this is an example of the visual sonic system which comp comprises the ultrasound system shown here accompanied with the laser. And since these systems are already well established in the clinic, we can just incorporate the laser, and if someone has a wound, we can use the photoacoustic probe to determine the extent of infection. 
And this can be very important and useful, uh, not only in big hospitals, but also in field hospitals and in the ER, where sometimes determining the extent of infection is extremely important as quickly as possible. So in North America, currently, there are several photoacoustic imaging systems that are undergoing clinical uh, uh, trials uh, for validation. And uh, there's an example from Korea, and this figure is provided by courtesy of Dr. Jisoo Kim, who's a visiting scholar from Korea, and he's in our lab. And they basically have a photoacoustic system shown here where they have their probe, there's a water and a holder, and you can place it on the skin, and it can basically, with a motor, just do a scan either on the forearm where you can image here, they show the image of vascularization using photoacoustic imaging. You can also see the hands and you can also see the foot. And over time, ultrasound imaging has been widely developed that now we can even connect an ultrasound probe to an iPhone or a, a screen. So I can see the similar transition happening with photoacoustic uh, systems. So in our bacterial infection imaging agent, we basically have a signaling agent, which will be an optical dye. And there are several uh, probes used or targeting moieties that are used to target these signaling agents to bacterial infection. Some rely on antibiotics, peptides, uh, or antibodies. Unfortunately, such agents are strain specific mainly and can only uh, be taken up in gram positive bacteria. And we believe that we need a more generalized uh, functional group that targets our signaling agent to a variety of bacteria since wounds and surgical site infections are caused by infections with multiple pathogens. So here we are using maltodextrin. And maltodextrin is basically a starch, uh, which is uh, produced, uh, it's produced by degradation of starch and, uh, or glycogen. And it's shown to be an important source of carbon and energy in numerous bacteria. And what's unique about maltodextrins as a targeting agent, that it targets the maltodextrin uh, transporter. And the unique thing about the maltodextrin transporter that it's only present in bacteria and is not present in mammalian cells. And then because uh, maltodextrin is used as a source of energy, such uh, sugars are internalized within the bacteria in high concentration, which can improve uh, the sensitivity of our imaging. And there are a couple of examples of maltodextrin-based imaging agents. Uh, the first one here is an F18-6 maltotriose, so it's confirmed of three sugar moieties, and it's labeled with a radioactive isotope of F18, and we can use it for radio imaging, and this is developed in our lab. And there's another one developed by another group by Murthy and co-workers, uh, where they developed a dye attached to maltohexose, which is a six, a six sugar moiety, and they've shown in rats and uh, preclinical uh, imaging settings how well this imaging agent is used to use fluorescent imaging to image bacterial infections. Um, very briefly, I wanted to show the mechanism of how this transporter works, and this mechanism is based on an example shown in uh, E. coli. So what happens is the maltodextrin can be internalized through a general transporter show, uh, named maltoporin, and in the periplasm shown here, the maltodextrin can bind to maltose binding protein. And this occurs here at the non-reducing end, which is shown here in red. Upon binding to the maltodextrin, uh, to the malto, uh, maltose binding protein, this can facilitate the binding of the maltose binding protein into the malGFK transporter in the inward facing mode. And once it binds, it further squeezes the bottom of the malGFK2 transporter, providing means for ATP to bind. And once ATP comes in and binds, it further squeezes this transporter from the bottom, forcing the opening of maltose binding protein, releasing the sugar into the MALF pocket. And upon ATP hydrolysis, basically uh, it opens again, allowing the sugar to internalize. And the reason I'm mentioning this uh, mechanism as it's very important to decide what is the best site for functionalizing this sugar. So in my presentation today, uh, the study outline is basically number one, uh, to determine the ideal site of functionalization. So our group the, added a radioisotope here, the F18, to maltotriose, and it added it here at the site at the non-reducing end, while Morthy and coworkers attach a dye here at the carbon one, it's shown in blue. Uh, so in my job, I wanna compare the two and see what is the best way to uh, develop an imaging agent that can be taken up as quickly as possible. Uh, second, I wanted to further expand on the synthetic platform to provide means for amenable functionalization of these sugars. As uh, a lot of people know, with sugar chemistry, it's extremely hard, and uh, producing uh, these derivatives at a high concentration uh, in high amounts uh, will be uh, very useful for clinical translation. 
Next, uh, we want to determine what is the best maltodextrin scaffold for our photoacoustic imaging agent. Is it maltotriose with, with three sugars or maltohexose with six? And I'm utilizing photoacoustic and fluorescence imaging uh, to assess these in mouse models. So as a chemist, I owe it to my uh, department to show uh, some chemical structures, but I'm not gonna go in detail in these synthetic schemes, but happy to answer questions later on. But basically in the F18 derivative, so the radioactive derivative of multitriose, one of the intermediates is this azide derivative shown here. So what I've done is this was provided to me by Dr. Mohamed Amavari from our lab, uh, where I took this, deprotected uh, the acetate groups with hydroxy and then linked the dye through a very simple uh, chemistry. And to make the uh, other uh, dye where we functionalize at the other side of the sugar, I basically was inspired by the work done by Murthy and coworkers, but further established a, a better synthetic step where we improved the yields and reduced the synthetic step by one. So now it's three steps in order to get the final product instead of four. And in this case, we took this compound, deprotected and attached the dye. So before, testing the final product. We wanted to make sure just with this azide functional group, which one is uh, still active and can still bind to uh, bacteria. So basically we took the first intermediate shown here where the azide is at the non-reducing end and then the azide shown here at the reducing end. And in this uh, experiment, we do a competition assay where basically we try to compete our compound of interest with a known radioactive maltose, which is the two sugar firm, and we know that this sugar can be internalized through the maltodextrin transporter. From there, upon competition, we wanna see how much of this activity is reduced after incubation. And the more you, uh, you block the binding of this radioactive maltose, the better your compound is. So if we look here at the bar plot, uh, here is the percentage activity blocked, and we found that when we have both either the three sugar or the six sugar, when it's fun functionalized at the reducing end, it blocks the uh, maltose really well, which means that it gets taken up into bacteria uh, very well. While we found that even with just adjusting the six uh, prime group, which is the non-reducing end uh, with the azide, it directly took away how well the sugar gets internalized to bacteria. This tells us that any further work needs to be done at the reducing end, we, and we should not use uh, this uh, other compound. The following step now, we basically de developed a fluorescent derivative of both maltotriose and maltohexose, and we wanted to see how well it gets taken up in a variety of bacteria. Uh, some of them are gram positive, some of them are gram negative. And also as a control, we had some E. coli mutants where we basically took out some of the maltodextrin transporter uh, components in order to see how specific uh, the uptake of these compounds are uh, in bacteria. And as well as we also took uh, dead bacteria and wanted to measure some of the nonspecific binding. So here I just want to quickly show that attaching the dye to either maltotriose or maltohexose did not affect their uh, uh, optical uh, uh, parameters and they both absorb and emit around the same amounts. And uh, this is basically the data from the bacteria binding assay. So here is the how much uh, of the compound is taken up in bacteria. So the higher the better. And we can see that here in the solid colored groups we find that both compounds, the maltohexose and the maltotriose, are being taken up in gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And some of them include staph, bacillus, and pseudomonas. And we do find in these uh, checkered uh, boxes that when we either kill the bacteria before incubation or we take out some of the components of the transporter, uh, we find direct reduction in the uptake showcasing the specificity of this agent to uh, metabolically active uh, bacteria with the maltodextrin transporter. So before we get to imaging, we wanted to do some in vitro characterization. So this is in tubes uh, or in a plate reader. Uh, we are using fluorescence in an IVIS imaging system, and this system allows us to image the whole body of a, a mouse and up to five mice at a time. So it's a very good tool for us to assess how well the compound distributes within the body and accumulates an infection. And we did find that uh, the fluorescence imaging is slightly higher sensitivity uh, than uh, the photoacoustic imaging. And this is mainly due because the dye we chose is more geared towards fluorescence than photoacoustic, but we thought this is a great start 
uh, to use uh, for our preclinical assessments. And future work will focus more on, on conjugating a dye that is more geared to photoacoustic imaging. And we find linear enhancement of the signal. And this here is a tube phantom, and it's provided also, it's developed by uh, Visual Sonics, where they have a really nice holder that we can uh, put tubes and insert uh, different uh, comp compounds in the tubes. And we can measure both the ultrasound shown here and the photoacoustic of uh, the compounds. Following that, we wanted to establish the best uh, laser wavelength to use for photoacoustic imaging. And here uh, we can see that uh, it seems that excitation around 700 and 750 provides the best photoacoustic uh, signal. And there was no significant difference between those two imaging parameters. So uh, one thing we also wanted to answer is to, are we, are we gonna be able to image basically infections on biomaterials? So a lot of times we conduct surgeries where we transplant like hip joints and hip transplants. And would we be able to even image any infection on these transplants even before putting it into humans? So what we've done here is we took catheters that are sterile. Some were incubated with staph. And staph is one of the main causes of uh, infection of uh, bio uh, materials. And uh, this staph is very unique that it's a, a pathogen, uh, the, the Zen 36 pathogen is developed in, uh, in the labs and it provides its own bioluminescence. So this allows us to basically visualize the uh, presence of staph directly from staph itself. And we can compare that to uh, the after incubation with our compound. So in this experiment, we took sterile catheters, some were incubated with staph, and then incubated with our compounds for about an hour, and then we rinsed it with PBS, and then imaged uh, with fluorescence, as well as photoacoustic imaging. And uh, as controls, we had catheters that were just sterile and not incubated with any bacteria, and we also incubated with our compounds and PBS. And interestingly, so here we see this is a bright field image of the catheters, and there's an overlay of the fluorescence signal. So the closer to yellow, the higher the fluorescence signal. And in the bottom here is the bioluminescence, which comes from the bacteria itself. And uh, the closer it is to red, the higher the signal. So as we can see here, when we have catheters that were incubated with bacteria, we directly can see staph on it. And when it's incubated with a compound, we see high signal, uh, fluorescence signal in these catheters, allowing us to image using fluorescence imaging, the presence of bacteria on these catheters while the catheters that were sterile and incubated with the compound, we barely see any signal. In addition, we had catheters that were just incubated with bacteria and not incubated with our compound, and we don't see any fluorescence. In addition, we dipped these catheters into agarose uh, gel to allow us to image them with photoacoustics. And, whoops. and here we can find that the ultrasound image showing a axle image of the tube, where we can also visualize the uh, photoacoustic signal uh, showcasing the presence of bacteria within this catheter, while the control catheters do not show much photoacoustics and we can quantify the signal as shown here. So now to the exciting part, uh, we get to the in vivo imaging. So in all of our studies, we did these studies in animal and mouse models. And the first uh, animal model we used is uh, called a uh, murine myositis model. And in this case, we uh, inject bacteria, live E. coli, into the thigh muscle. And as a control, we can inject either saline or dead bacteria on the left thigh. We then inject our compound through the tail vein, allow it to accumulate at the site of interest, and then we conduct fluorescence imaging over time. And the optimal time, which in this case we uh, determine to be the overnight time point, we image with photoacoustics. And in the case of photoacoustic, we basically choose the longest plane of the muscle and we do a 3D scan using uh, a robotic uh, holder that is also provided by Visual Sonics, where it can do a full scan and provide you a 3D image of the muscle. And obviously we conduct the same thing on the left eye. So here, if we look at the fluorescence images, we find uh, we did a comparison study as a start to compare between maltotriose versus maltohexose to, cheat, to see which one is better. And from the beginning, we see within even two hours, we can directly see higher accumulation using both compounds in the infected muscle compared to the control. And if we quantify the signal, we basically quantify the signal shown here in the infected muscle and normalize it to the control. And we can get this ratio. And from the beginning, we did find that our probe, which is the three sugared uh, multi-trios, 
compared to multihexose had significantly higher signal in the infected thigh compared to the control thigh compared to multihexose. In addition, we did some influx studies. And in influx studies, we basically test how fast does the compound accumulate. And this was done in vitro. And we basically incubate the compound with bacteria uh, and quickly start washing steps at different time points. And we found that maltotriaz indeed seems to be internalized within the bacteria uh, much faster than uh, maltohexose. And if you look at the photoacoustic images, so here in top is the ultrasound image, and it's a 3D ultrasound image, uh, scan over 10 millimeter uh, thickness. And the muscle is around here, shown here in ROI, and the leg itself is placed on a rubber holder, shown here with the yellow. In the middle is just the photoacoustic, and in the bottom is the overlay of the photoacoustic image over the ultrasound. And indeed, from the beginning, we do see by eye that photoacoustic signal in the infected muscle is higher than that in the control muscle. And we see that in both cases using multitriose as well as multihexose. And when we quantify the signal, we did find that the signal in uh, photoacoustics was not that significant, uh, significantly different between multitriose and multihexose. Uh, but in both cases, we did see higher signal in, in the infected versus the control muscle. But when we normalize the uh, signal of the infected over the control, we did find that the multitriers did have better signal to noise, uh, which kind of implements, we feel maybe the slightly lower sensitivity of photoacoustics to this size seven dye, which is more geared to fluorescence imaging, might not show the exact difference. And also there's, there are further developments that are necessary to better quantify these photoacoustic signals uh, in the future to further uh, provide means for molecular imaging application in the future, which I'll also be discussing in the end of the talk. Uh, so other than that, we wanted to further assess why is the maltotriase performing better uh, than maltohexose. And in this case, we wanted to make sure to see which one is actually more stable in the blood. And here we did an in vitro plasma stability test. We did it in murine, which is the mouse model we used, uh, as well as rats, where Murthy and coworkers tested their uh, compound. And we obviously wanted to make sure uh, to, f to visualize that in humans as well. And as a control, we just did this in water as well uh, with PBS, which is just salt. And we did the incubation over time. And then we extract our compound from plasma and then run it uh, through uh, HPLC, which basically provides means to analyze uh, different peaks that represent the compound and the decomposed versions of the compound. And here we find the data. The data is represented by the peak representing the compound of interest versus all the other peaks shown in the chromatogram. And we show it as a percentage intact. So the higher the percentage, the better, the more stable the compound is. And interestingly, we can see here in purple, which is in PBS and just uh, a buffered solution, we find that both compounds are completely stable over time. Uh, while in uh, blue and maroon, which represents the murin and rat respectively, we did find that the maltotriose and maltohexose starts decomposing. But I want to note here the difference in the y-axis. In the case of maltotriose, it dropped to around 70% after two hours. And this is due to the starch degrading enzymes, which break the sugar. Uh, but we found that in maltohexose, it starts decomposing from the beginning. So mere seconds uh, after collecting the compound, we start seeing that the, these starch degrading enzymes break down maltohexose to smaller sugar forms. And this go down to around 1% by two hours, and it's pretty much gone over time. While in our case, it drops down steadily until 20% by 10 hours. Interestingly, we found that we were very lucky that the maltotriase that we we're using is completely stable in human. And we didn't find any degradation of the sugar itself in humans. While we still observe degradation of maltohexose in human plasma, where it dropped down to 10% in, uh, in two hours and further went down over time. So this was great news. And this really highlights that in order to translate uh, this imaging agent to uh, humans, the maltotriase is the ideal uh, scaffold to use for photoacoustic imaging. And hence, the next studies are all conducted on the maltotriase derivative of this compound. So following this, we wanted to uh, basically assess, uh, further conduct experiments on our new developed uh, imaging agent. So we did the same uh, myositis model where we injected dead bacteria on the left eye, a live bacteria on the right, and then we monitored with uh, fluorescence imaging over time. And we can see from one hour, we already see higher signal enhancement in the infected muscle compared to control. 
And the main uptake uh, clearance mechanism we find is through the kidneys here shown in the mouse. And we found that after 20 hours, it is the best signal to noise uh, ratio where the majority of the uh, compound is cleared out from the uh, mouse and the retention occurs in the infected thigh alone. In addition, we conducted another control where instead of injecting dead bacteria on the left thigh, we injected one of the uh, uh, mutants of E. coli, which lacks one of the transporters uh, of uh, maltodextrin. Uh, and in this case, we also see uh, not much signal in the left thigh control, and we significantly see higher signal in the uh, infected thigh. As a control, we also wanted to conduct more imaging where we image the both uh, thighs before injecting the probe and after injecting the probe and compare uh, the muscles to better find means to uh, distinguish the signal coming from the probe compared to the intrinsic photoacoustic signal. And here, as shown before, the top is ultrasound, middle is photoacoustics, and the overlay is here in the bottom. This orange here shows the patella, which is the joint, and the blue is the muscle or the ROI and the yellow is the padding that we put the muscle on. And we indeed, from the beginning, we always see that the signal shown in the infected thigh muscle after injecting the probe is significantly higher than that of control muscle or uh, both infected and control muscle before injecting the probe. And we can also quantify the signal and find significantly higher signal in uh, this muscle. So following this, we wanted to conduct an experiment with a more relevant model. And one of the geared uh, applications of this platform is to utilize it for infection of wounds and surgical sites. So in this case, we established a, uh, a wound infection model where we conduct an incision on the back of the mouse. And then in this incision, we put some uh, staph, which is one of the main causes of uh, wounds infections in the hospital. And again, reminder, the staff has a bioluminescence coming from it, so it can provide a signal of its own that we can detect. And then we inject our probe, allow it to accumulate and monitor over time. So the first test was to assess, can we differentiate between wounds infected with different amounts of bacteria? So this way we can use this imaging strategy to determine the extent of infection and how bad is it. And the next thing was to assess antibiotic treatment. So can we give someone a treatment and use this imaging strategy to validate if this treatment is working. So the first experiment is basically we had different mice. So here on the left was injected with 10 to the four colony forming units. Uh, so this uh, represents how much bacteria is in. The higher the number, the more bacteria we put in the wound. And then we can directly see here in small blue that there's some bioluminescence that represents the infection itself. And interestingly, we can also see direct correlation of the fluorescence signal with that of the bioluminescence, where we can detect using our imaging uh, strategy, the bacteria as low as 10 to the four uh, when the wound is affected with 10 to the four. And this increase over time, and we can also quantify it and see the increase with the increase of amount of bacteria. Secondly, we did a treatment study uh, where we put the bacteria in the wound, image the mice after injection, and this image is 20 hours post-injection, and then uh, we administered antibiotics to the mice twice daily, and this was vancomycin in this case, which kills staph. And uh, after uh, around 16 days in this case of the experiment, we injected our probe again and imaged the following day. And we can see both BLI and fluorescence showcase the disappearance of the uh, infection. And we can also use our imaging modality to uh, assess uh, how effective this treatment was. So following this, we wanted to conduct the same experiment, but we can add a bit more controls. And we also wanted to add photoacoustic imaging to the uh, experiment. And in this case, we had to change our mice. So instead of the white uh, mice, we had to use the SKH1 elite female mice. And these are basically uh, mice without fur, but they're still immune competent. So they have their immune, uh, their immune system is not compromised. So in this case, we also lowered the, uh, the place of the wound in order to allow 3D imaging using the ultrasound probe, which would interfere with the anesthesia nostril if it was placed here on the top. So we place the wound, we inject our probe, then we allow the compound to accumulate, we image 3D with photoacoustics, and then uh, conduct treatment over time. And in this case, we needed around six days, uh, twice daily, uh, because we put less bacteria in the wound. And then uh, we had 
the mice divided into two groups, one that was administered with vancomycin, while the other one was just given saline, so just water, uh, as a controlled group that did, was not treated. And we we're hoping to see if we can use both fluorescence and photoacoustic to distinguish between these two groups. Interestingly here, uh, on the left side here is the untreated group, so the group that was not given vancomycin, and on the right is the treated group. And uh, we find that before we can see the infection and you can see there's a lot of infection happening in the wound. And we can also visualize that with fluorescence. And uh, after, uh, after six days, and this is without giving the treatment, while we still see decrease in the amount of infection in the wound because this mouse has immune system and was able to try to fight uh, the infection. And this happens in, in mice differently. Uh, we still can also observe that infection in fluorescence uh, as well. While the treated group, we found that after treatment, the infection was completely gone. And also, we do not see any uptake of the fluorescent agent showcasing specificity, as well as ability to utilize this imaging strategy to assess the effectiveness of treatment. And this can also be quantified, uh, showcasing significantly higher signal after treatment compared to before treatment. Also in photoacoustic imaging, we basically placed the probe on the back of the mouse and did a 3D scan. Uh, here is around where the spine is. Uh, and basically we can see before treatment, uh, some, a photoacoustic signal shown here in the untreated group and the treated group before treatment. And then when we image again after treatment and after injecting the probe uh, for 20 hours, we see that the untreated group has even visually higher photoacoustic signal compared to that of the treated group. And when we quantify these signals, we also directly see significant reduction in the photoacoustic signal in the treated group after treatment compared to the untreated group. So lastly, I wanted to finish with a quick observation that we were uh, seeing in this wound model over when we were imaging over time. So in this case, we wanted to see how long can we image using fluorescence imaging, which is the most sensitive in this case to this probe, uh, after injecting the probe? Can we actually do serial imaging where we image over time? So indeed, we found that up to 144 hours after injecting our probe, we can still see the infection and we can still quantify there was significantly higher fluorescence signal after uh, in the infected sites compared to uh, before injecting the probe, uh, showcasing ability of conducting serial imaging uh, using this platform. And this is just an example of a mouse where basically the bacteria didn't take up and its immune system was able to kill the bacteria. And we find that we do see uh, some bacteria before injection and some at 44 hours, and we can slightly see some signal around here, as well as in the kidneys. But then the bacteria completely died at 72 hours, and we start seeing also the fluorescence was completely gone. And this highlights some potential of using this uh, imaging agent where maybe if someone is doing a surgery, we can uh, inject our probe, allow it to accumulate, and at some point we can establish a signal where if the signal is higher than a certain number, we can determine that, hey, maybe it's this person where their immune system, where the infection is occurring and is going to grow. And this can help uh, drastically uh, make, make drastic decisions of uh, how strong you want to go with the treatment, if you want to administer a higher dose of, of antibiotics. Uh, while on the other hand, if, say, the imaging strategy does not show as much signal in the beginning, this could potentially mean that the patient is not that the wound is not infected, and you could potentially avoid some uh, antibiotic treatments that are not necessary, as well as uh, provide less burden on the patient. As So to summarize the findings, uh, we were able to determine the ideal site of functionalization, where we know now if we want to functionalize something in the sugar moieties, for them to perform and accumulate in bacteria, it has to be on the uh, reducing end. We also developed ways to utilize some click chemistry to attach a variety of agents to the site. We also established that the alt, uh, optimal maltodextrin scaffold to use for infection imaging, it is indeed multitriose in this case. And uh, we were able to show a preclinical evaluation where we're able to detect bacterial infections and monitor uh, antibiotic treatment. So for future work, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, on the chemistry side, in the imaging agent, we really, for clinical translation, we really need to work hard on deciding the optimum dyes uh, for uh, this imaging strategy. 
obviously the ideal thing is to have dyes that turn on once they accumulate in bacteria. That way you can avoid any signals happening outside of the uh, system or from circulating uh, compounds and can better distinguish uh, the dye using photoacoustic imaging. In addition, we found that it is crucial to work on and look into the stability of these probes, whether it's on the dye side or the multitriose in this case, uh, where we need to establish something that is shelf stable, plasma stable, and does not photo bleach, uh, so by exposure to light really quickly. Because the idea here for uh, transportability, we want this to be developed, put in a vial, and just stored until dissolved uh, right prior to use. And we also learned from our work in cancer imaging uh, that we really need not to just develop compounds that are hard to make, but also find really amenable ways for scale up and synthesis. As in the end for clinical translation, we need to be able to produce these in a GMP facility. So a general manufacturing procedure and uh, hard chemistry is gonna be uh, very difficult to translate into these systems. On the imaging parameter side, we really need to make sure to develop new sequences. And this is constantly growing in the PA, uh, in the photoacoustic uh, imaging field since it's a very novel modality. Uh, many people are investing a lot of time and effort in developing different sequences, uh, different uh, multiplexing strategies where we can differentiate variety of signals uh, from one image, as well as different ways for background subtraction. And uh, this can be, will be very crucial, especially in our case, since when we're imaging wounds and surgical sites, there are a lot of changes that are occurring uh, over time into the tissue itself, whether through increase in infection, or inflammation or even wounds or tissue healing. And it is important to establish platforms to be able to already know how are the photoacoustic signals changing into these uh, different tissue changes. Uh, that way we can better background subtract uh, these signals as well as better quantify the signal uh, for uh, during photoacoustic imaging. In addition, for serial imaging, we believe that artificial intelligence as well as 3D imaging and using robotic handles are important to take away uh, user uh, experience uh, from the imaging side. As it's known in ultrasound, uh, it's very dependent on user's experience. And we would like to develop different ways where we can use holders to image the site and then ensure during serial imaging that you're imaging the, exactly, the exact same site at the same angle. On the molecular biology side, uh, we're still working on developing uh, different CRISPR knockout uh, strains uh, to further understand how well uh, the mechanism of internalization is happening and how well these uh, agents are being internalized uh, into bacteria. We are also looking at different mechanisms if how big of uh, moieties can we attach to these sugars uh, and still not affect the internalization of the sugar inside the bacteria to look into potential uh, internalizing uh, other uh, drugs using the sugar moiety and not just signaling agents. Finally, we're in consistent uh, talks with clinicians and statisticians to really identify the optimum cohorts uh, to test uh, this platform on and establish the best relevant, uh, most relevant infection models to assess these uh, agents in hopes in clinical, uh, for clinical translation. As you can see, uh, this uh, showcases that we really need a lot of interdisciplinary work and this interdisciplinary discussions between chemists, biologists, medical uh, physicians, as well as uh, engineers to really properly develop tools that are gonna be useful for clinical translation. So I would like to thank a lot of people. I wanna thank the Gambier Lab and specifically Dr. Gambier for his inspiration and taking us over and really allowing us to uh, witness a lot of his vision and uh, his mentorship has been great and I feel very uh, grateful uh, to be in a, such a great uh, lab. Uh, I wanna specifically thank Dr. Gayatri Gaurashankar uh, who's a research scientist in our lab and basically taught me everything I know about bacteria. Uh, and Dr. Dan Seiberg for all of his guidance uh, on the photoacoustic engineering side, uh, as well as Tom Haywood and many people uh, in our facilities. Uh, I want to thank the Fujifilm Visual Sonics team as uh, I've been working with these systems since 2012 and uh, uh, it's been always great to be part of this forum and uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share some of the work I'm doing. Uh, and I want to thank you all and I'm welcoming everyone for questions. Great, fantastic presentation, amen.
so at this point in time, we will open this up to our Q&A session. Again, if you have a question for our presenter, please submit that in the Q&A button located at the bottom of the screen. Um, so, Eamon, we have quite a few questions that have rolled in throughout the presentation. Uh, the first one is, does the photoacoustic probe penetrate biofilms to image the encompassed bacteria? Yeah, that, that's, that's a very good question. So uh, actually, another thing that we need to add to this is a lot of people are looking into, so a lot of the infections that happen on biomaterials, after the bacteria precipitates on it, they start forming biofilms. And we also, one of the molecular biology questions that we want to answer is, can we even use this imaging strategy to image biofilms? Uh, we know of some peptides that I've seen in the World Molecular Imaging Congress that are targeted to uh, biofilms. So we don't know if, we, if this imaging probe can image biofilms, as a lot of the biofilms are not metabolically active bacteria. So we don't know if this can be internalized in it. But as to uh, the penetration, we've shown that we can actually see something within plastic there were some images uh, I know with depth and the different penetration depending on the uh, on the structure or what it's uh, the basically the implantation is made of. Uh, we might have some uh, problems imaging through the implantation, but we hope that we could image on the sides and around the surroundings and really just focus on the tissue uh, interface between the tissue and the uh, implanted. Uh, Biomaterial, uh, the implanted uh, system. Yeah, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, great. Um, can you tell us how many bacteria correspond to a given color spot? Oh, uh, we could do a color. So, in many ways, what usually happens to determine how much bacteria uh, per pixel, uh, we don't have that number. We could make a calibration curve in vivo where we put different amount of bacteria and see how much bioluminescence it shows uh, to establish that. And some uh, the traditional ways, we basically take a swab of that bacteria and measure how many colonies it forms. Um, so we don't know exactly how much bacteria is within the pixel, but we know that we could, in using fluorescence imaging, if we put uh, around 10 to the four colony forming units within the wound, we are able to visualize that using fluorescence imaging. In the case of photoacoustics, the least amount we were able to see is 10 to the 6. Uh, and I looked into some uh, studies that even happened in the 80s where they were studying how much bacteria do we even need to have on a wound in order for it to uh, establish an infection. And the numbers that we're showing is around 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 colony forming units. So in quantitation wise, we don't know exactly how many bacteria we have per pixel, but uh, we do know how much is within the wound. Great, fantastic. Can you tell us what is the spatial resolution of the photoacoustic imaging at the depths that you're using? Ooh, uh, the spatial resolution. So in ultrasound and photoacoustics, the, basically the spatial resolution, meaning how small the pixel is within the image, uh, is uh, basically uh, counterparted with the depth. So the deeper uh, imaging you can go, the less resolution you'll have. So the more fuzzy it will be. Uh, the spatial resolution here is in the visual sonic system. I don't have a number. I want to say it's in the micron scale, but I really don't have a number. But it's basically, it's the same as the visual sonic system, which is what we use and which is probably provided by the manufacturer. Yes, and actually, um, just speaking on Fujifilm Visual Sonic's behalf, we do have a technical specification guide that you can retrieve from us regarding the Laser X. And each of the probes will have a specific axial and lateral resolution, um, again, specific to that probe. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's a good question, yeah. So Dr. Zlitny, the next question is, have you cross-correlated your photoacoustic imaging with histological counting of bacteria at their place and across the body? That's a very good question. Um, we do have some specimens from the myositis model, which is the muscle infected one, where we collected the muscle itself and we froze it. Uh, but we did not collect that information. Uh, we do confirm, we try to use bioluminescence imaging, which comes naturally from the bacteria itself, especially in the staph study, uh, where we try to use that as a way to correlate the fluorescence or the signal to uh, the bioluminescence.
but for the photoacoustic imaging side, it would be really cool to develop slides of those frozen tissue maybe, and then do a photoacoustic microscopy on it, as well as do histological staining. That will be a really nice figure to add uh, for future projects. But we think the reason we stopped here is now we know this dye is not commercially, it's not gonna be clinically translatable, and we wanna develop a better photoacoustic version of this, uh, imaging agent. So we really hope to add these kind of experiments for the next stage where we focus completely on photoacoustics and really uh, conduct histology and correlations. So that's a very good question. Yeah, fantastic. And as a follow up um, to the earlier question about how low of a ba bacterial population can you detect? I know you said it was 10 to the 6, but we have a follow up question asking after what time frame? Yeah, so we so indeed, so that's why I'm very specific when I'm saying we, we cannot say we can detect 10 to the 6, but we are detecting infections loaded with 10 to the 6. So when we're imaging, we're imaging overnight. Uh, so basically the bacteria is growing a bit. So saying the sensitivity is 10 to the 4 is not correct. We should, like what we try to say is we can infect a wound with 10 to the 4 and we're able to visualize that. I did find like even when I try to infect the wound with less than 10 to the 4, it was really hard for the bacteria itself to be taken up. So we couldn't even visualize that on bioluminescence. Uh, but I think the ideal way to quantify that is to collect the, uh, the, uh, a swab test, basically a swab from the wound itself and measure the colonies uh, to quantify accurately or develop a way where we can have a calibration curve where we can correlate the bioluminescence signal to the colony, uh, colony forming units. Uh, accurately without the effects of changes of the tissue and the penetration. Uh, but yes, so that's the. Great, thank you. And can you comment on what type of robotic handles you're using for the 3D imaging with photoacoustics? Is that just a standard uh, Visual Sonics 3D motor? Yeah, I actually just use the standard 3D motor from Visual Sonics uh, in this case. Uh, what we're hoping eventually in the future because uh, so the mice are a bit small compared to a transducer that can potentially be used with humans uh, so it was really hard to reproduce the exact same plane with the mice i try to tape everything the same way and have the the robotic uh, transducer just above uh, perpendicular to the mouse uh, but we're hoping in the future say for wounds and stuff there will be handles maybe that you can put your arm in in the exact same way how your fingers fit, that you basically get the same exact plane and the transducer never moves. And these robotic angles can take the exact same uh, angle uh, to properly image the same site uh, repeatedly uh, over time. Yeah, great. Um, so just a final question that we have here. Can you tell us why would this uh, type of imaging be useful in comparison to radio imaging derivatives of these uh, particular agents? Yeah, so yeah, we always thought about this as like, why would we need this? But that's why we're really specifying the utility of such agents for wounds and surgical sites. But one big difference uh, between these strategies for radio imaging, it's very sensitive and you can also do whole body imaging so you can detect everywhere where the bacteria is. But unfortunately, this uh, approach is always gonna be limited to main hospitals, as well as hospitals besides cyclotrons, which produce the radioactivity. And you need a radiochemist in-house every day whenever you need that. And PET imaging, which is the uh, imaging modality used to image the radioisotope, is also more expensive and harder to accommodate everywhere in the world. But while tra like translating a, a tool like ultrasound and photoacoustics, it's more transportable, it's much cheaper, and uh, we think with this imaging agent, we'll have it in a vial, it will be placed in a fridge, and then you just reconstitute it and just inject it. So you don't need any chemists around, you don't need anybody except the imaging and the imaging tool. Uh, so we believe for this utility, if, uh, although it is limited in the depth, but we feel it can be much easier to translate, uh, as well as for field hospitals and uh, armies and such things, uh, that will be much easier to accommodate. Great, well, fantastic. Well, Dr. Zlitny, I'm sure everyone, including myself, thank you very much for your time today and this excellent presentation. Um, again, this presentation will be made uh, publicly available on our customer resource portal. And if you have not already created a login account for that, by all means, please visit our website and you'll just need your system serial number. So again, thank you, Dr. Zlitny, and thank you everyone for joining today.
thank you everyone and obviously uh, my contacts are available and if anybody has any more detailed questions or anything like that feel free to contact me and thank you again for your the opportunity yes thank you so much